Good evening and thank you for joining us. Tomorrow marks the closest Ontario has been to normal since the pandemic began and it's been a long time coming for business communities. Proof of vaccination will no longer be necessary to enter restaurants and many public facilities and capacity limits are being scrapped for all indoor settings. Corey Nordstrom has the story. The owner of Rooster's Bistros calls it welcome news that his employees will soon no longer have to ask incoming customers for proof of vaccination. As of March 1st, all indoor settings in Ontario can lift the mandatory QR code scanning and full capacity is once again permitted. Breathe a little bit more of a sigh of relief that we are back to our more normal situation and, and I, I think it's just our next step forward of, of the 300 steps that we've had to take during this whole process. The hope is that the lack of restrictions can lead to more customers through the door, ultimately recouping some of the lost profits of the last two years. And without a staff member designated to welcome patrons, owners won't need as many workers on at a time. You've got uh, extra staff required for some of the extra pieces that needed to be done. That's an extra cost to the business. And so to take away those extra costs and that extra staff time, etc., will be positive as well. Kamuzi, however, will not abide by all of the allowed changes as he thinks customers would prefer the extra space between neighboring tables remain in place. We'll uh, keep our protocols here at Roosters a little bit different. We're not going to put in more tables and try and jam people in as we did in the past. Uh, we're still going to, uh, you know, kind of adhere to a little bit of social distancing. The scrapping of QR codes is a choice for business owners, not a mandate. But Robinson says she hasn't heard of any that are going to keep the proof of vaccination system. But based on the clientele or nature of the service, some may keep the restriction past March 1st. In more of the physical uh, activity type areas, gymnastics and, and dance studios, um, and you know, looking to their clients to determine where their comfort level is. City facilities like the Canada Games Complex and local arenas are doing away with both the code scanning and capacity limits as of Tuesday morning. One place locals will still need QR codes is the LU Fieldhouse for this weekend's Thunderwolves basketball games against McMaster, as vaccinations are still required on university property. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. Premier Doug Ford says his government isn't far away from dropping Ontario's mask mandates. Here's what he had to say this morning. Right from the get-go, I'm listening to the chief medical officer. It's his advice when they're going to come off, and, and uh, we'll wait for his advice and recommendations. And once he gives the recommendations, uh, we'll, we'll be able to move forward. Uh, what I'm hearing over, over the next few weeks, maybe after March break, when the kids get back, but we'll, we'll see. I don't want to set a date. Um, you know, and there, There's no secret. There isn't a per person I talk to likes these masks. No one likes them, but uh, I'm going to follow the advice and we aren't, we aren't far away. Last week, Chief Medical Officer of Health Dr. Kieran Moore said Ontario's mask mandate will likely be lifted at the same time across most sectors, including in schools, when the time comes. Well, this as the COVID-19 situation at the Regional Health Sciences Centre remains troublingly high. The number of COVID patients at the facility topped out at 51 over the weekend before a slight decline today. There are now 45 COVID positive patients being treated at the regional hospital with eight in the ICU. The Health Sciences Centre is still operating above capacity at 106%. The occupancy rate inside intensive care has risen to nearly 91%. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting 115 new cases over the weekend. The number of active cases has fallen to 242, down from more than 300 on Friday. The active case count has dropped sharply in the Northwestern Health Unit. There are now 233 active cases, down from 409 before the weekend began. The test positivity rate is also going in the right direction. It's now at 26% down from more than 32 percent. The province has announced new legislation that's set to be introduced aimed at helping so-called gig workers. It would impact people who make a living from app-based services, things like rideshare drivers and couriers. As Colin DeMello tells us, it could mean more money in their pockets. All across the province on any given day, app-based workers are on the road. There are 
probably tens of thousands of platform workers who depend on uh, gig work as a full-time income. Those workers are now being given landmark legislation driven by the Ford government. Legislation that would make Ontario the first province in Canada to establish a minimum wage and other important rights for the digital platform workforce. But advocates say the wage isn't comprehensive because it only covers the time spent driving passengers or delivering food, not the time spent waiting for the next job. We do not make as much money as people might think we do, and uh, we do have to cover all the expenses of our vehicle operation. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, you know, pay uh, double premiums on things if we want to be part of these social programs. The company behind the ride-sharing app Uber asked the government to legislate at least $18 per hour to account for the time in between jobs and for gas and insurance. The government is now being pressed to increase that minimum wage. $15 today is not what $15 in 2018 was. So, you know, we need to, we need to look at what actually is a living wage, and there probably needs to be another jump in, uh, in the increase. The Minister of Labour, however, put that responsibility back onto companies. Look, there's nothing preventing any corporation from paying their workers more. In fact, I encourage it. So if they want to pay 18 or $20 an hour, they can do that today. The Ford government has been embarking on a series of pro-labour reforms that, from a Conservative government, has raised eyebrows. Today, the Premier was asked if he's shifting his party to the centre, just ahead of the provincial election. It's funny, you say, say, well, my kids call me a bleeding heart liberal now, but I'm pretty fiscally conservative. The election is on June 2nd. That was CTV's Colin DeMello. Local MPP Judith Monteith Farrell questioned Health Minister Christine Elliott at Queen's Park today over the Northern Health Travel Grant. The NDP member says claims and appeals are taking too long, in some cases up to a year, leaving people unable to afford the health care they need. The travel grant is used by Northern Ontario residents to apply for financial reimbursement when they have to travel long distances to access specialized medical services. Monteith Farrell says her office has received many calls about how long the travel grant process takes. She's introduced two private members' bills to fix the grants, but the PCs haven't supported the changes. Elliot responded to Monteith Farrell at first by talking about the importance of virtual medical care Here's what the opposition member had to say about that. People across the north are looking for answers. Virtual care is not the solution. You can't have heart surgery virtually. What has this government done to help the people who use this program? What is this government, when is this government going to keep its word, improve the Northern Health Travel Grant, to ensure equitable access to health care for people in the north. Well, we are working on improving the Northern Ontario Travel Grant to make sure that the people who need it can receive their payment in a timely manner. We know that in the past, there were long periods of time that passed before people were able to receive reimbursement. We want to make sure that they can receive the reimbursement as soon as possible because we know that there are significant costs related to this. Is the work done yet? No, we're still working on it, but we have made significant improvements in the last three three or four years. The work of some young Indigenous artists is being showcased on a Thunder Bay City Transit bus. The Mamaway Art Bus was launched today and it highlights the Indigenous connection to the land and the contributions of First Nations people. Vasilios Bellos reports. Dozens of people attended the unveiling, which highlighted the importance of Indigenous representation in Thunder Bay. A total of five local Indigenous youth contributed to the new Mamaway Art Bus with a piece being developed through multiple sessions led by artist Shelby Gagnon and Morningstar DeRosier. Both said the experience working with the youth artists was incredible and explained what impact they hope the art bus has on the community. I think it's extremely important to have Indigenous representation in the city of Thunder Bay. It's a high population of Indigenous folks. And even with that, people, you know, other Indigenous people seeing this bus might spark them to get involved with more arts, arts projects or arts collectives in the city. Because we thought about our strength that comes from the land, the strength that comes from these spirits, that come from these beings. And so we wanted to bring that to our city uh, who wouldn't otherwise have had access. And then so we want to keep that strength going around that city, that love going around that city. The Mamaway Art Bus was guided by the City of Thunder Bay's Anishinaabe Elders Council and also featured collaboration with groups such as the Indigenous Relations Office and the Youth Inclusion Program. Athena Hudson is one of the five Indigenous youth that took part in the project and says while it took her out of her comfort zone, 
She is proud of the work she and all the other artists have done. This project was really scary for me, but I am really happy that I um, powered through it and I stuck and I stayed despite all my fears. While the most important part of the project was the creativity and determination of the Indigenous youth artists, the city was involved throughout the process. Mayor Bill Morrow was in attendance for the unveiling and explains what the bus represents in the community. I think they're an expression of the city of Thunder Bay doing its part in one way here today in terms of moving forward with reconciliation. I think it's a very public demonstration of, of the work that we're trying to do to, to be part of the reconciliation effort. Thunder Bay residents won't have to wait long to see the Mama Way art bus on the road as it officially begins making its rounds tomorrow. Vasilios Fellows, TVT News. I can't wait to see that driving out on our streets. St. John Ambulance's biggest fundraiser of the year has kicked off. The annual Spring into Summer Trailer Draw has added importance this year due to the pandemic. This Grey Wolf trailer is worth about $40,000, but it can be won for just 10 bucks. The Ambulance Service's yearly raffle is now underway, and for the first time, tickets can be purchased online. St. John volunteers have already been busy thanks to a great first weekend of sales. Volunteer coordinator Brian Edwards says the programs the draw supports are trying to rebuild. The earlier we sell out this draw, the more time that not only myself, but um, uh, our, our, our core volunteers can focus on, on getting the therapy dog recruitment going again, holding evaluations, uh, getting our cadet program up and running again, uh, our car seat safety and our medical first response unit. Um, you know, we're, we're looking forward to getting those going, but uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a process to, to start those up again. Edwards says they've ordered 500 more tickets this year because of the new online platform. They can also still be purchased in person or over the phone as well. Many residents are probably happy to see February come to an end. According to Environment Canada, the past month has seen much colder temperatures than the average for February and almost three times the normal amount of snowfall. Mitchell Ringos has more. The usual daytime high for February is minus 5.6 degrees Celsius, but this year has dropped all the way down to minus 8.6. Also, the mean temperature has went from an average of minus 12 degrees Celsius to minus 16.9, which isn't too far off the record low of minus 19.6 recorded in 2015. February also saw back-to-back -back record lows set on February 24th and 25th, when temperatures drop to around minus 35 both days. Warning preparedness meteorologist Stephen Flissfetter confirms that this was not your typical February. It's a pretty far departure from the normals. Uh, typically, if it was a below normal year, we'd be expecting one, maybe two degrees below as an average. Uh, but seeing three degrees below normal uh, for the daytime highs, it's fairly unusual. And it wasn't just the temperature that was irregular this month, it was also the immense amount of snow we received. Thunder Bay saw 67.6 centimeters of the white stuff in February, when the normal is only 26.9. That works out to two and a half times the usual amount. Despite the repeated shoveling, we're still a long way from the record snowfall of 110 centimeters set in February of 1937. Even so, Flissfetter says all this added snow could be a concern for flooding in the spring. Hopefully we'll have a regular thaw freeze cycle uh, through springtime to uh, alleviate that uh, pressure a little bit. But with that additional snowfall, it is going to be a concern for the coming months. Flissfetter says it's hard to talk about March as a whole, but it is looking like a continuation of this cold pattern and we could still see more snow. Mitchell Ringo's. TVT News. Well, Fiona, we said it there 